Hi, I'm Sarita Bradley with the Texas Coratani. We're here at the Austin Celtic Festival. Today I'm demonstrating weaving and the early technologies, the early loom technologies of the Celtic people, the folks that lived in the British archipelago before the Romans came and even after the Romans invaded that island. Um, this is the loom technology that was primarily used from Anatolia, which is what we call Turkey today, all the way north and west of there into the far, far north of um, in Europe all the way to Scandinavia. This was used from primarily the Neolithic period, which is the late Stone Age, all the way until the year approximately 1000 AD. This is the same loom that was used to weave the sails of the Greek armies that sailed for Troy to bring Helen back. This is the same loom technology that was used by Penelope as she awaited Odysseus's return from the Trojan War. She was actually weaving and unweaving her tapestry on this kind of loom. You often see in paintings of that time, she's sitting at a horizontal loom, that would be incorrect. She would have worked standing at a work weighted loom. This loom was used right up until the time that the Bayo Tapestry was created. The Bayo Tapestry is a long embroidered panel that was created right after 1066 to commemorate the um, victory of William the Conqueror over the Anglo-Saxons. And that we know that that linen was woven on a warp-weighted loom. It was probably one of the last great projects that was done on that because prior, uh, immediately after that time, the horizontal frame loom became the standard for almost all of Europe. So this goes back a, back a long, long way. And it comes up to us in a not too, too distant uh, past. But nobody does this anymore except people that are into reenactment or historic research. So that's why we do this today. What I have set up here is a more complicated kind of pattern weave. Uh, you can do a plain weave, which is just like every even yarn is lifted up and then every odd yarn is lifted up and then every even and then every odd and that just goes back and forth and back and forth. And that's a plain weave. What I'm doing here is what's called a twill, which is where the weft yarn, which is the yarn that goes across these, these are called the warps, and that's what um, you set up to weave with. So these are all your individual warp yarns, and then the weft that goes across uh, will go over a different sequence of these yarns in a pattern and create a kind of diagonal uh, pattern fabric. Your jeans, the jeans that you are wearing, are uh, a woven twill. The twill goes back a long, long ways. We know that they were woven in prehistoric times because we found little tiny scraps of them in salt mines in um, what is now known as Austria. Salt was mined out of there even in antiquity and they would, the miners would go in and they would use scraps of old cloth, like the, the tails of their cloaks, to cushion their hands from from the the the, 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 the um, they used mostly deer antlers and wooden tools to mine salt with, but those were hard tools. So they would wrap them in cloth, and we have those fragments of cloth left from those salt mines. So we have little little pieces of cloth that are like a few inches by a few inches that go back to 2000 BC. Um, and we know they did these complicated weaves because we can see that in the patterns of those textiles. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be lifting different, uh, these are called heddle rods. And each individual warp has a loop around it. The loop is called a heddle. This is still the same word that we use on a modern loom today, although it's not a string and a stick. It's a little more complicated apparatus. But when I lift one of these, a certain number of the warps are going to come forward, and I'm going to lay them up on these big forks, and then I'm going to pass a shuttle through here and pull a warp across, or a weft across. The wefts are the cross uh, yarns. And then I'm going to beat that up into the cloth. And I'll be showing you that here in just a few minutes. So I'll, I'm going to take a break, and we're going to set up the loom to do that. Um, let's talk a little bit about the loom itself and, and what the components of the loom are and what they do. The first thing is we have these big tall posts. They're called the verticals. They support 
the beam across the top, which is called the cloth beam. The cloth beam, as the fabric gets woven, is rolled. And it's a little heavy for me to do it, but you take a big uh, lever and you roll the, the beam and you roll the cloth up onto it. So as you weave, you can, and I'll show you more about the weights at the bottom, you can lengthen the cloth out from the bottom up. This is the only loom that we know of where it was traditionally used to beat up. Most different kinds of looms, even in Asia and other parts of the world, you start at the bottom and you, you weave and weave and weave and you build up and you, and you weave down. This one, you start at the top and you weave up and the, the cloth comes down to you. So it's a very unique and very different way of doing it. Um, that's why you know it's uniquely warp-weighted loom is because you weave from the bottom up and, it, and the cloth uh, comes down. <clears throat> so these are the verticals. The cloth beam is at the top and the cloth rolls onto it. All of the individual warp yarns and the, war the yarns that are tied to the, to the cloth beam and go vertically like this and are weighted at the bottom are called the warps. And then the, the, the yarns that go across as we weave the cloth are called the wefts. And I'll show you though, more about those in a minute. Each of the individual warps are tied to a heddle rod by individual loops of strings called heddles. Lift and I drop the heddle rods depending on how I'm, I'm weaving, and I'll show you that as we go along here. Uh, the forks are stands that the heddle rods are lifted out and they stand on for us to put the weft through the warps, and we'll, we'll show you that when we do the, the actual weaving in a minute. <coughs> Um, so these are the heddles, these are the forks, and the rest of it is about the weights. Down at the bottom of the warps are, I use little individual bags of weights and also I use uh, ceramic weights. These are ceramic discs that have been fired. They're not as heavy as the little bags. We know that what was used primarily in the the Middle East and in um, uh, parts of Northern Africa were clay weights like this, but they were different configurations. Some of them were uh, just lumps of clay, some of them were circular or like balls, some of them were like little pyramids, some of them were actually stamped clay like this. Um, the Greeks used some that were stamped with uh, an image of an owl who is the one of the uh, animals that is um, associated with Athena, and Athena was the Greek goddess of weaving. <clears throat> These individual bags have weights in them, and you have to have your warps under tension to be able to beat a weft yarn into the, the web of the cloth. So it's really important that all of the individual warps be under tension, and you can see I've tied them into groups. Each of these is a group of about 16 individuals, and that little bundle is tied to a, a weight. And that keeps everything under tension. So let me double check a, um, one of my things back here. I think I may have something unweighted, but let me uh, do that and then we'll start again. So in order to lay a weft yarn, and this is a shuttle, it's a plain stick shuttle and it has, I don't know if you can see it in the, the light here, it's got a dark uh, thread on it. It's a linen thread. This is a linen warp, so I'm weaving a linen fabric. Um, that, that's a weft and we're going to lay it into an open space between the warps that is called a shed. I don't really know why it's called a shed. That's just the nomenclature. I wish I could tell you a story behind it, but I don't know if there is one. But when we open up a space between them, it's going to be a particular grouping of warps that are going to be lifted and, a, and the other ones down. And that opening becomes the shed between them. And we lay the weft in, and then we beat it. So I'm going to show you how to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift... Oh, this is one of Cindy's projects. Wonder how it ended up here. Kettle bar <laughs> number. 
three, kettle bar number four. <laughs> And if you look around on the side here, you can see a nice big opening. That's that's what the shed is between the wharfs. Yeah. Bring my shuttle through. Just just enough to board. I was thinking the spike, but you know that would work. That's the next step. Yeah. But just enough to where it doesn't have to move. Just enough. I'm just gonna let the warp lay itself down there on the the pedals themselves. A large dog. A large dog. So you link them. Start to open them up and you get the recording. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. They do. They link them. That would be awesome. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, I've just sat and watched three. Lift it up in there. Look at that yesterday. I don't like some. I don't like some. But a child, I can't expect that. Even though, because I drank six children out here yesterday. You know, after telling, but it was all. You know, like, why would I say that? Okay, now to really beat the individual weft in, I need to change the sheds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop one of my heddles and lift another one. So that just changes the, the numbers of, of the different warps that are, are up or down. And then I use this stitch, which is called a sword beater. I do. I'm frustrated. Because it's an amazing. Because it looks a little bit like a sword. <laughs> and I use that stick, yeah. put it into the shed I just opened, and then I use it to heat up. Yeah. Hold on, I need to make a different shed. Hold on. <laughs> Again, lifting different different heddles, the different levels, and and you keep going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and, back and, forth. and eventually you start to see your cloth coming down and you get more and more and more and more and more. It's slow. It is a very slow process, which is why we all need to be mindful of how textiles were used and worn in that time. You couldn't just go down to Walmart and buy a new t-shirt. You had to grow the flax or raise the sheep and then harvest the flax or shear the sheep and then process that fiber by uh, breaking the flax and removing the individual fibers from the plant or by combing and carding the wool. There's a process of dyeing, then spinning. Then, after it's spun, it's ready to be put on a loom. So it's a very involved and complicated process to create clothing. 
clothing that was incredibly important because they lived in a climate that was cold, often very wet and rainy. So the way you protected your body from these elements was from the clothing that you created. And this is usually from animal fiber and from plant fiber. And that's a, a long and complicated process. So people would have clothing that would last them for years and years. They didn't go out and buy the latest style from this year's Paris fashion show. They they wove and, and, and spun and wove and, and created clothing that their grandparents wore. And fashions changed very slowly that way, and they were much more practical than what we wear today. There's much more, not to say that they didn't have pretty ornaments and nice jewelry and did some fancy embroidery or some nice thread work on it. They did, uh, and all of that was very important to them because they liked to wear fine things. But you didn't change your clothes out every year or every other year. You wore a shirt or a tunic for maybe four or five years. You know, it, it a, a good cloak might last you ten years. So, and things were handed down in families as children outgrew them, older children outgrew their clothes they were given to the younger children to wear. So we all need to have a little more respect for the textiles that we wear. Interestingly enough, it was the textiles that were the first things that were industrialized during the Industrial Revolution because of the demand of people needing textiles and clothing around the world. So that's a little bit about early loom technology. And if you have any questions, you can have Mr. Mar or Mr. Norwood send me an email or a text, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you for showing us that very much. Thank you.